And joining us now is Graham Smith, Afghanistan correspondent at the Globe and Mail. We welcome you home. We welcome you back to TVO, your second visit to this program. Well, we're glad that you went and came back safe and sound. Yeah, it's good to see you again. Canada's original commitment to Afghanistan, as you know, was supposed to go to the year 2003. We're now going to be there till at least 2009. And I wonder, in your travels with the troops, how they feel about that. Well, the troops are absurdly enthusiastic about their jobs. Um, I have trouble sharing their enthusiasm when we're being shot at or if we're lying somewhere cold and wet and awful. Um, but especially the infantry guys, they have been training for this all their lives, and they show a perverse enthusiasm for the most awful situations. Now, why do you say absurdly enthusiastic? Well, because it really is, I think, a little bit unhealthy um, to enjoy dangerous, difficult situations quite as much as they do. Um, but they do, and that's you know this is what they've trained for. It's what they um, they want to do. There are some of the younger soldiers uh, who just started and uh, weren't quite sure whether they wanted to be in the military or not. And after about I think 10 minutes in Kandahar, they realized that they didn't really want to be in the military. But but for the most part, yeah, most of them are um, are quite enthusiastic about their jobs. Too. What is it that they like about their jobs? Um, I think they like the difficulty of it. Um, you know, uh, for a young man to be able to go uh, to the other side of the world and, and sort of to prove yourself in battle, um, you know, uh, generations of, of young men have been, have been aching to do that uh, throughout the centuries, uh, and the, the Canadians are no exception. I don't want to put words in your mouth here, but it, do they get joy out of killing people? I don't think they get joy out of killing people. I think they get joy out of um, heroism and adventure. What's a typical day like for them? Um, it depends where they are, but um, for the, the battle group, for the, the combat soldiers, they'll wake up um, on a, a cot often, um, and the first thing they see when they open their eyes is uh, the morning sun and the blue sky, because the sky is always blue, uh, usually, um, and uh, they're usually outside. Um, and they sleep outdoors. They sleep outdoors. Not intense. Um, sometimes intense, but um, you know, if they're moving around, as, as they almost always are, uh, then they're, you know, they're waking up beside their armored carriers, and they're um, often what's called a leaguer. So the, the armored uh, carriers are in a circle somewhere, maybe in the desert or uh, some sort of protective formation, and um, they wake up with the dawn and uh, and they go to bed when it's dark. And again, not meaning to be ridiculous about this, but are they not worried about snakes or scorpions or other terrible things that they're going to get bitten by in the middle of the night? Yeah, of course they're terribly worried about snakes and scorpions yeah. because um, I actually saw um, so some troops improvise a flamethrower with a can of WD-40 and a lighter uh, just to get at a, a, a camel spider that, that was uh, terrorizing them. So yeah, um, yeah they're, they're worried about these that things. That just proves they're normal if, if that's the case. Right. Uh, the conditions that they are trying to operate in right now, Let's just start with the weather. What's it like over there now? Uh, right now it's cold. I guess down to about zero in the, in the wintertime. Um, uh, you know, last winter we had a lot of rain. It rained every single day through the winter, and the mud was awful. It was uh, knee-deep and caused a lot of problems. This winter, um, the mud is not quite as bad. It hasn't rained quite as much. Um, and so the winter is actually quite pleasant sometimes, uh, especially in November when the temperatures get down. It, it feels like a nice fall day uh, in Canada. And there are three squares a day every day? Uh, yeah. That's uh, not an issue. The troops haven't gone hungry. Uh, there have been some problems with the supply chains uh, because the roads are getting increasingly worse. Um, but no, they haven't gone hungry. Okay. The relationship between Anglophone and Francophone soldiers, I presume they're serving together. Yeah. How's that working out? Uh, it works most of the time. Uh, the, there has been some tension. Um, I, I did a series of uh, photographs recently of the bathroom walls on sort of on a whim uh, where, uh, you know, just the graffiti showed that the, uh, the Anglos were, were, were squabbling with, with the Francos um, in, 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 in quite graphic terms, you know. Can, can you tell us? Well, not on TV, I think. Can't um, say. It's, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff just wouldn't, uh, just wouldn't go. But there's a lot of, you know, tete carré and stuff like that going back and forth. What is the language in which orders are given? English, usually. Is there any French um, spoken? But if, uh, yeah, if, if, if it's just a French unit, um, then they'll give the orders in French, yeah. Okay. That's the relationship between French and English. How about the relationship between Canada soldiers and the local Afghan population? How's that working out from what you've seen? Uh, it comes and goes. Um, if we've killed someone recently, then it tends to go. Um, you know, the Canadians uh, have had some instances where they've shot some people um, on the roads, usually at, uh, when they're stopping vehicles and the vehicles don't stop and then they have to uh, open fire. 
Um, the Canadians haven't had quite as many uh, civilian bombing incidents uh, as some of their neighbours in Urzgan and Helmand, but there have been those incidents, incidents over the last two years, and, and that tends to deteriorate things very quickly when the um, local hospital fills up with people who have suffered bomb blast injuries. Graham, we've got this idea of the, the sort of average private soldier who hands a chocolate bar to a local kid or something like that, and that's how the bond is established, but is there any of that kind of low-level contact going on or is it all higher ranking people dealing with higher ranking people in various tribes? Those things do happen um, and the, what's sad about it is that they're often set pieces you know and I was I was at a soccer game where the Canadian soldiers were helping out with a, a soccer program and so the soldiers were mixing with the kids and it was all very um, you know telegenic um, but it doesn't happen often enough and so um, that is one of the one of the real problems with the, the Canadian mission is that the the Canadians are a little bit insulated inside the wire uh, from the Afghans and don't have a good visceral understanding for uh, for their issues. But does most of the communication take place leader to leader, as yeah. it were? Yeah, exactly. Yes. And so the question is, who are those leaders, and how did you choose them? Because you have to remember that this is a government that's largely installed by the West, and so the West has installed these people and then looks to them as representatives, so it's sort of a circular feedback me mechanism. Well, you say installed. They, I mean, Karzai did get elected once upon a time, didn't he? In a system that was engineered by the West, yeah. Um, You're not satisfied that he's completely legitimate then? Oh, he's a legitimate leader as, as best you can get in Afghanistan. Uh, it's just that that's a very strong qualifier. Understood. In Iraq, security did improve after Sunni tribes began to cooperate with the Americans and fight against al-Qaeda. Any evidence that that's happening in Afghanistan? Well, there's a really fascinating situation that's evolving in Musakala. Uh, Where's that? Uh, Musakala is in northern Helmand province, right next door to uh, where the Canadians are in Kandahar. It's about 100 kilometers northwest. And um, the, there, the uh, government has gone in in force and reasserted government control after the Taliban had control of the area. And uh, what's emerged afterwards is that that was actually a bit of a negotiated deal with a Taliban commander in the area, that the Taliban commander turned tail and decided to join the government, and he's been rewarded afterwards with uh, the governorship of the area. So he's now the political leader for Karzai in an area where before he was the political leader for the Taliban. Um, so we are, in essence, negotiating with the odd Taliban leader here and there. And it's a very controversial issue inside NATO. Uh, that area is British controlled, Helmand, um, and it's no accident that the British have a very different philosophy than the Americans, for instance. Um, uh, you haven't seen any of the similar kind of deals in Zabul, which is US controlled. How about in the areas that are Canadian controlled? Does that happen? Not yet. Um, last November 2006, a bunch of uh, uh, tribal elders went to uh, the uh, authorities in Kandahar and said, we would like some kind of negotiated settlement in Panjwe, which is where a lot of Canadians have been fighting and dying. And that idea was shot down immediately. So uh, the local people, the local Canadian officials on the ground, then are, what, not open to negotiations with Taliban under the same kind of circumstances? They told me at the time that the that proposal never made it to the Canadians; that it was shot down by uh, the governor of Kandahar and also the chairman of the provincial council, Ahmed Wali Karzai. Got it. What role do Afghans want the Canadian presence in their country to be? Uh, Afghans have much more limited ideas about what government should be um, and what they expect from a government. Um, you know, they don't really care whether it's a democracy or whether it's liberal. They just want a, a government period that will bring some peace and order and stability uh, to their areas. That's why they accepted the Taliban in 1994 when the Taliban came in and said, the, the Taliban initially said, we're not very good at government, so we're just going to bring you uh, law and order, and that's all for now. And the people of Kandahar loved that uh, because it, it, it was a very minimal government presence. And so uh, one of the, the real problems now, and it's being acknowledged, that the, 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 the foreigners have in Afghanistan is that they've tried to do too much. Does that mean that they don't want the Canadians, what, doing any military? They'd rather just have them doing reconstruction? Or what's the, how does it divide up? Well, in fact, it's just the opposite. They'd rather have them do just the military oh, uh, and, you know, leave the decision about whether to build a girls' school up to the village rather than up to some, uh, you know, some Westerner with big ideas about the role of women mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. Well, on that issue, uh, how, how do you think men and women break up, break down rather? Is it women want us there more than men do or what? You know, it's really hard for me to say because the women who I would be able to speak with in Afghanistan are women who... Uh, are the exception. Um, you know, any woman who's going to speak to a Western journalist like me 
um, is not a normal Afghan woman. And oh. so it's very, very hard. What does that mean? Well, um, uh, in Afghans, Afghanistan's traditions, um, they enforce purda. It's the separation between um, a married woman and the rest of society. So uh, the idea is that women are cloistered away. And so certainly uh, no uh, foreign man uh, would be uh, interviewing an Afghan woman, which is why, for instance, these opinion polls that you see are so ridiculous because um, the, you, know, you see people going around and asking uh, ordinary Afghans what they think when, in fact, it's impossible for pollsters to reach most of the country in terms of the rural areas. And it's also impossible for pollsters to speak to most um, uh, you know, traditional Afghan women. Well, humor me here for a second, because we do have some numbers here. Ed Veronix was over there in 2007 doing some public opinion surveying. And here's what they found. Look at the monitor over my shoulder here. On the issue of the presence of foreign countries in Afghanistan, 60% of those surveyed said, yes, it was a good thing. Only 16% said it was a bad thing. 22% equally good or bad, and 2% didn't know or didn't have an answer. And how about their opinion of Canadian troops in Kandahar? Uh, again, 26% saying very positive, 34% saying somewhat positive, so certainly a strong majority in favor. 14% uh, somewhat negative, 5% very negative, so a very small minority uh, not approving, and 5% not knowing. Uh, okay, I understand your reservations that you have with official public opinion surveying, but you talk to lots of people. You have a sense about how things are on the ground. Does that jibe with what your understanding of things is? It really depends on who you talk to. Um, and I don't say that just to be coy. I mean, there, there really is a, a, a polarized breakdown of public opinion uh, in the South. If I'm standing on the street in Kandahar and I ask someone, uh, what's your tribe? I can tell you almost for sure what, what their answer is going to be to all those questions. If they say uh, they belong to one of the Xerox Durrani tribes, which means uh, Papuzai, Alukozai, Baraksai, those tribes. Uh, they're the government tribes, and the person will say, yeah, no, I'm generally in favor of, of the, the presence of the Westerners here. And do they really believe that, or have they been told to say that? Well, everything in Afghanistan is tribal. It doesn't matter whether they really believe it. It's what their tribe believes. Hmm. And that's why the idea of an individualistic opinion poll is a bit ridiculous. And so if, I, if they're Panjpai Duranis, if they're Nurizai, if they're Alizai, et cetera, uh, quite often they're, they're against the foreigners. Have you interviewed women alone, just you, yeah. Have they been caught talking to you? Um, well, the, again, the, the women I've been able to interview, for instance, are uh, candidates for uh, uh, mem being members of parliament. Okay, that's or, different. Um, yeah, or, or women in Kabul. Um, in, in Kandahar, um, you know, I've interviewed women who are part of a women's NGO. Um, but how about the, or I mean, if there is such a thing, the ordinary average, you know, Kandahar housewife who's obeying her husband and raising her children and basically that's all she's doing. Then she wouldn't be caught dead talking to me. She and if she be. was talking to me, she would be dead. Got so, it. yeah. So you don't risk that lest no, obviously not. she'd be caught. No, obviously not. Just 20% have, as the numbers suggested there, and again, going along with your reservations about these numbers, but just 20% have a somewhat or very negative opinion of the Canadian troop presence in Kandahar. And I wonder this, given the legendary pride and resistance to outsiders, uh, that we hear about with regard to Afghanistan, are you surprised that number isn't way higher? Uh, there is a lot of um, resistance to, to any kind of foreign presence in Afghanistan, but Afghanistan also has a very proud tradition of using uh, foreign presences. You know, it's been hundreds and hundreds of years that various different foreigners have been supplying uh, various tribal factions with military uh, support or with, with money. Um, it's, um, they have a very ambivalent relationship with the outside world, but they have learned how to use uh, the foreigners. And, uh, and I think NATO is certainly um, uh, not immune to that. When are you going back? Next week, in a few days. Why are you going back? This is trip number 11? Trip number 11, yeah. Why are you going back? Uh, it's important work, I think. Um, I'm going back because it's a place in the world where I can contribute to our understanding of what's going on. And it's, you know, it's really important for Canadians to understand what's going on because we don't right now, I think, and it's tragic. All this time later, all of the attention this issue has received later, you still don't think we have a good sense of what's going on? Yeah, sometimes I wonder if I'm not doing my job right because I've put a lot of work into this over the last couple of years. Um, but I'll keep working at it. I think. What's the single most important thing we need to know about what's going on over there right now? I think uh, the tribal dynamic is really important. I've been talking to a friend of mine who writes for The Economist, and he's going to be coming out with an article on the tribal dynamic very soon as well. Um, we are in a tribal war. We have chosen sides 
in an ancient, ancient blood feud uh, that has been going on throughout the generations. And we need to understand that, and we need to try to mitigate the damage of that decision. And it's um, incredibly complex and involves all kinds of weird names that we, we don't, aren't familiar with and it takes a long time to learn. Uh, and it involves a way of thinking that's completely alien to us, but we need to try because that's how we're going to uh, solve the situation. If we have backed a horse in this race, have we backed the right horse in your view? Uh, we need to stop backing horses. <laughs> uh, this is the mistake that has been, you so know... We've taken the wrong approach in your view. Yeah. I mean, we can't just keep picking a guy who we like and putting a uniform on him and making him uh, the boss of things. It just doesn't work that way. When you come back from Trip 11, this is where we'll pick up the conversation next time. Graham Smith, thanks so much for visiting us at TVO tonight. Thank you.